Hello, everyone. Welcome to Good Book. My name is Ken Ingold. I'm one of the pastors here at the Church at RV, and we are in the fourth week of our study of comparative religions. Thus far, far we've looked at religious worldviews in week one, kind of an overview of the entire topic. And then we started looking at the various major religions throughout the world, looked at them in chronological order from when they were founded, going way back to Judaism. Uh, it was founded way back in Adam and Eve, way back in the beginning. And then Abraham came along. We had the Abrahamic covenant as so we followed Judaism throughout history. And then we jumped into Hinduism, 1000 to 2000 BC. We aren't exactly sure when it was founded, but somewhere in that time period. And then an offshoot of that, which we're going to talk about today, Buddhism, 500 BC. And then we're going to go to Islam next week. And that was about AD 500. So a thousand years later is when that started. And then we're going to start into Christianity. Now, I'm not saying Christianity is newer than Islam. It actually started obviously with Jesus back at the, at the first century AD. But we're going to take some time and look at Christianity as a whole. And then we're going to break it down. And we're going to talk about Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And then we're going to spend a week on looking at the major Christian denominations throughout the world. And then we're going to spend some time talking about the sect, so the offshoots of Christianity, what we often call cults. So that's kind of where we're headed in this nine-week study. I'm very excited about it. We've been enjoying it so far. So today we are jumping into looking at Buddhism. Uh, so I wanted to share with you some important dates in Buddhism, and I also want to show you a map, because I think it's really important to understand this. If you look at this map, you see the spread of Hinduism and Buddhism. You go, well, why is it so important to link those two together? Because Buddhism is an offshoot of Hinduism. So 2000 to 1000 BC, we have Hinduism founded in India. And then in 563 BC, somewhere right around there, Siddhartha Gautama was born, Buddha. He became Buddha. And then Buddhism was established in 525 BC. And then the very important distinction is we understand Buddhism, we understand Christian worldviews, we understand religious worldviews, Buddha dies in 483 BC. And that becomes a very important facet in understanding the importance of Christianity and what's different about Christianity from the rest of world religions. So again, as we look at Buddhism, it really is a study of the life of Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. And so that's where we're going to focus our time today, and then we're going to talk about some what Buddhism believes and what are some of their major beliefs, and then we'll look at the difference between them and Christianity. Also, we're looking at some of the, the, the sacred world sites for Buddhism. So it has some fun if we, deal, if we dig into this today. So born in India, Siddhartha Gautama, born in India in modern-day Nepal around 563 BC, like I said, he was born a Hindu prince. And that's really important because he was steeped in Hinduism, born into Hinduism, but there was a prophecy given at his birth that he would become either a powerful king or a great spiritual leader. A seer, a, a prophet, proclaimed that if Gautama ever saw four things, if he saw sickness, he saw old age, he saw death, and a monk who had renounced the world, he would give up earthly rule and discover a way of salvation for all of mankind. So if he saw those four things, this prophet said, no, he wouldn't become a powerful king. He's going to become a great spiritual leader. He's going to discover a way of salvation for all of mankind. So what did his father do? His father said, no, I don't want to become a spiritual leader. I want to become a great king. So he didn't, so to prevent him from becoming a spiritual leader, his father built him a castle and basically secluded him from society, stuck him into the castle, gave orders so that he would never, said, I don't want ever him to ever see a sick person. I don't want him ever to see an old person. I don't ever want him to see a dead body. And I don't ever want to have a monk anywhere near the palace because I don't want him to see a monk and think, oh, this man has renounced, this monk has renounced his um, worldly views and he's uh, finding success and he's finding value in the life outside of that. So his father was like, I don't want him ever to see any of that. So it's protecting him from that, isolate him from that. So Gautama spent the first 29 years of his life living in the castle, protected from the world, including being given a beautiful wife, Yasudhara, who bore him a son. But then one day, one day, Gautama was riding around the park surrounding his castle, and he saw four things. Yeah, it just happened to be those same four things that showed up on that one particular day. He saw a man covered with horrible sores. He saw sickness. He saw a man who tottered with old age. He saw 
old age. He saw a corpse being carried to its grave. He saw a dead man, and he saw a begging monk who appeared to be peaceful and happy. He saw a monk who had renounced the world and found satisfaction and joy by doing so. He saw the four things that the prophet said would happen. And so what happened from that point? Gautama realized for the first time in his life that he too could get sick. He too could get old. He too could die and he too could lose everything that he loved. So that night, Gautama began to think about the peace he saw on the monk's face and the joy he saw in him, even though he'd renounced the world and he was a beggar. And he thought, I don't know, maybe there's more to life than the luxuries of this palace. So at 29 years of age, in the middle of the night, he took one last look at his wife and his son, who were both sleeping, and he left the palace forever. And so Gautama shaved his head, he put on a yellow robe, he wandered the countryside as a beggar monk, he studied the Upanishads, the Hindu writings that we talked about last week, but they didn't bring him peace. Then he starved himself, he became a walking skeleton, but neither did that bring happiness. So finally, Gautama sat under a tree for 40 days and 40 nights. Now that's interesting, I think we recall a time of Jesus spending 40 days and 40 nights out in the wilderness. And although Mara, the evil one, tried to make him give up his quest, at the end of the 40 days, Gautama experienced the highest degree of God consciousness, nirvana. Literally the blowing out of the flame of desire and the negation of suffering. And through this experience, Gautama felt as though he had found salvation, he had found nirvana, and from that time on, he became known as the Buddha, the enlightened, the enlightened one. So that's the story of Siddhartha Gautama, the story of Buddha and how Buddhism was formed from this one man who was a Hindu priest, secluded and isolated from all things of the world because of a prophecy that was given to him at his birth, but he eventually saw those four things and walked away from the life that had been given to him and found that nirvana, found that peace, became the Buddha and starting the Buddhist religion. So I want to share with you just very briefly four sacred sites of Buddhism. I share these with you because they apply directly to what we just talked about. The first is the Golden Myanmar Temple in Lumbini, Nepal, where Buddha was born in 563 BC. So it's believed that this is the spot where this temple sits. It was actually where Buddha was born, or where Siddhartha Gautama was born. And this now has become an important Buddhist pilgrimage site. It's where people travel to. They want to see where Buddha was born because it actually launched a religion. Second is the Mahabodhi Temple. It's the Mahabodhi Temple complex in Bodhgaya, India. It's the holiest Buddhist site in the entire world. It's where Siddhartha Gautama attained enlightenment when he sat under that tree and he became Buddha. The third is the Dhammic Stupa in Sarnath, India. This is the location where Buddha delivered his very first sermon after he had become the Buddha, after he had become enlightened. This is the spot where he delivered that sermon and so it's marked as a religious and sacred site in Buddhism. And finally, number four, the Buddha Pranima in Kushnagar, India, where Buddhists attained nirvana, where he attained that salvation after his passing. So when he passed, um, you know, I'm going to get into it a little bit later, but um, Buddhism started holding on to some of those, those um, beliefs of Hinduism, of, of karma and reincarnation. But at this point, Buddha was beyond that. He was no longer going to be reincarnated. He attained nirvana. He attained salvation when he died. He became everything. And that's where the religion is based upon. So Buddhism. Let's talk a little bit about what Buddhism believes. Buddha, Buddha Siddhartha Gautama, began preaching and teaching about the meaning of life in his way to nirvana, salvation. He founded Sangha, an order of monks. He denied the Vedas. Now, the Vedas, remember from last week, we talked about this. These are the inspired scriptures of Hinduism. So he denied the Vedas and the Upanishads, which are also very important divine writings in Hinduism. He declared there are no help in attaining nirvana. So I paid no attention to those. So the Bhagavad Gita, um, the Upanishads, the Vedas, those things were not important to Siddhartha at all. So he said, nope, don't need those. And they also denied that man had a soul, the Atman that we talked about last week. So man does not have a soul. He emphasized ethics over ritual. 
He rejected the caste system. You remember from last week we talked about the importance of the caste system in Hinduism. It was very critical. Where you In the reincarnation, you, if you lived a good life, if you had good karma, you would rise up the caste system. If you had bad karma, you would move down the caste system. So he rejected that entire caste system. He said enlightenment is available to all, regardless of your stage in your life. But he accepted the Hindu teachings on reincarnation. So it's interesting because he's saying, okay, the light is available to everyone, but at the same time, you're still going to have this reincarnation that you're going to come back on different levels. And you also accept the teachings on karma, which is the merits and demerits, and the dharma, the duty one, the, the service aspect that the duty one has to perform according to their station in life. And he incorporated meditation and yoga into his teachings, which are also very critical components within Hinduism. So he kind of mixed and matched. He picked and chose. He said, okay, I like these aspects of Hinduism. I don't like these aspects of Hinduism. And he developed this new religion called Buddhism. His theory was that, it was called the theory of the middle way. He believed a spiritual path of salvation that wound between the extreme asceticism and unrestrained sensuality that Buddha knew as a Hindu. So he, he looked at life as this way. Life should be appreciated but you should not cling to it. Life should be enjoyed, but you should not cling to the beauty of life because some, you're, you're never going to be able to attain it. You're never going to be able to find beauty in life itself because it's, life is about suffering. So he described his middle way by offering four principles known as the four noble truths. First is this. Suffering is universal. Everyone is going to suffer. There's nothing you can do about it. It's a way of life. It's going to happen to you. So the act of living involves suffering from birth to death. But death does not bring relief for those in the Buddha's faith because of reincarnation, because you're going to come back. The cycle is going to continue, and you're going to suffer some more, and you're just going to come back. You live through life and death. You're going to be reincarnated. You're going to suffer some more but until you reach nirvana. Until that salvation comes, when you're released from this endless cycle of suffering, which is what had happened to Buddha himself. The second of the four noble truths. Suffering is universal. The first, the cause of suffering is craving. It's selfish desire. It's wanting more in life. It's seeing things out there and say, I want this. I want that. I want to have wealth. I want to have physical comfort. I want to have life good for me. And that craving is a cause of suffering. People remain in Buddhism in the endless cycle of reincarnation because they're too attached to their health, their wealth, their status, and their physical comfort. Until they can get beyond that, they're never going to reach nirvana. So the first of the Four Noble Truths is, is suffering is universal. Second is the cause of suffering is craving. The third, the cure for suffering is to overcome ignorance and eliminate craving. So in other words, if a person can remove craving from their life, if you can just get to the point where I don't want anything, I am happy with what it is, I have a want for nothing, life is good, I accept it, I find peace in what, exactly what I have, suffering will end. And if you think about it, there's a lot, about, a lot of those truths in that in Christianity. We talk about having joy in all circumstances and not trying to look for the things of this world. So philosophically, there's a lot of great things about Buddhism. It's looking at not attaching yourself to the things of this world, not finding your satisfaction and your joy in the things that this life has to offer. So the cure for suffering is to overcome that ignorance and eliminate the craving. And finally, the fourth noble truth. Once you suppress that craving by following the middle way, which we're going to get into, the, as he calls it, the Eightfold Path, which is a system in which a Buddhist can rid himself of tana, which is that attachment and that desire. Once you get rid of that, you suppress that craving, you put it aside, then ultimately you will reach nirvana. You will reach salvation by getting to the point of saying, I don't want for anything in this world. So what is that Eightfold Path in Buddhism? Right view right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right concentration, right, right mind. Now, it's interesting in Buddhism, there's not a lot of explanation on these, but they are pretty self-explanatory. Start with the right view. It's having a right world perspective. Be able to look at things and be able to see it from outside of yourself, maybe from a 30,000 uh, point view, they'll look down and say, okay, I have a view of what is going on in this world. I don't need to be drawn to it. Second is the right intention. 
I'm not, I'm not craving this, the, these things. I have, my, my intentions are good. I want to do the right thing. I want to, I want to make the, the right choices along the way. Third is an easy one, right? Speech. Speaking is being loving, is being kinding, is kind, is saying good things about people. It's not demeaning to people. It's not putting them down. It's not attacking people. It's having right speech. It's things that is honoring, speech that is honorable. Right action, again, very self-explanatory. Do the right things. Fifth, have a right livelihood. Now, this becomes interesting in Buddhism because it means depending on what you do for a living and the, and the job that you have, the occupation, the career that you have, has, plays, a, plays a part in the eightfold path of Buddhism for you to reach, ultimately reach that nirvana, to, to take that next step, to go beyond that. So you want to have the right livelihood. You want to have things that are, are honorable careers. Right effort. It kind of goes back to right action. It's, make, it's putting the effort out. It's being motivated. It's doing the things you need to be doing. Right concentration. Again, my focus is where it needs to be. I need to, I'm focused on the things that are important. And right mindfulness. I care about the right kind of things. So that is the eightfold path of Buddhism that ultimately leads you to that middle way, that path that leads you to nirvana. Once you put aside the cravings and the desires and you accept life for what it is and you enjoy what has been offered to you. So it's a key belief of Buddhism. And I'm just going to read this to you. So I'm two different slides, but I think it's really important. It kind of succinctly describes what is important to Buddhism. In recognizing the four noble truths and following the eightfold path, one will still experience loss. One will still feel pain. One will still know dis disappointment, but it will not be the same as the experience of dukkha, which is translated as suffering. You won't be experiencing suffering. You're going to experience some pain. It's going to feel uncomfortable, but it's not going to be the level of the suffering because you continue to elevate yourself beyond that, which is unending. That suffering is unending because it's fueled by the soul's ignorance of the nature of life and of itself. Because we, we have this innate desire to crave what we don't have we're going to continue down this path. It's going to completely, it's going to involve reincarnation after reincarnation and ultimately trying to reach that point of nirvana. But once you eliminate that, when you follow those four noble truths, you follow the eightfold path, you'll be able to push that aside and you'll ultimately be able, be able to reach nirvana at some point in time. So one can still enjoy what it comes down to in Buddhism. You can still enjoy all aspects of life in pursuing the Buddhist path only with the recognition that these things cannot last. It's not in their nature to last because nothing in life is permanent. Again, in Christianity, that's not so far off. Philosophically, that is a right idea that we're not to focus on the things of this world. Buddhism teaches that you, you recognize, okay, these things, I can enjoy them for now, but they're not going to last because they're just simply not permanent. And the second aspect of that, so Buddhists compare this realization to the end of a dinner party. I find this a very interesting analogy. When the meal's done, one thanks one's host for the pleasant time and goes home. But one does not fall onto the floor crying and lamenting that the evening has come to an end. The nature of the dinner party is that it has a beginning and an ending. It's not a permanent state, and neither is anything else in life. You enjoyed it in the moment, but you recognize there's a beginning and ending. It's not going to continue on. It's not permanent. I enjoy it there, and I say, okay, it's time to move on from there. Instead of mourning the loss of something that one could never hope to hold on to. One should appreciate what one has experienced for what it is and let it go when it's over. So it's a very good philosophy for life. Um, it's just there's so many ways that they just fall short of what Christianity is all about. And that's what I want to dive into next. How is Buddhism different than Christianity? What are the key elements that separate Buddhism from our relationship with Jesus Christ? The first is this. Buddhism is mostly atheistic. They believe Jesus is an enlightened man. He's not God. So John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4 and verse 14 says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John is very clear that Jesus, being the Logos, the Word, he is God. So he's not just some enlightened man. He is God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made, and in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then in verse 14 is how we come to understand the incarnate Jesus coming from heaven to earth. The Word became flesh. Jesus, the Logos, the Word, who is God, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only Son who came from the Father, full 
of grace and truth. So Buddhism will teach he's just an enlightened man. He's just kind of elevated to a point. He's not Buddha, but he's, he's, he's risen in status along the way. We understand from Christianity, we know from God's word that Jesus is God. And he came flesh and dwelt among us, gave us, lived out the example for us how to live our lives. Most importantly, paid that price on the cross so that we could have new life in him and that he's resurrected from the grave. Next, key difference. Buddhism believes that the only way to reach nirvana, salvation, is through self-effort, it's through works, which we understand from God's words, that's exactly the opposite. I don't have the scripture on there, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Romans 3, 23, a very familiar passage, says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man. This is kind of really reflects upon Buddhism. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it is a way of death. And so Buddhism can do all the things they want to, to self-effort, to try to reach that nirvana, to reach salvation, but it may seem right to them, but in the end, it leads to death. And Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you can't reach nirvana. You can't get salvation because of our good works. There's nothing we can do to earn our way into heaven, to earn our way into salvation is because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And finally, Buddhism teaches that people do not have a soul or a spirit. Remember I said he, he cast aside the, the idea of the Atman that Hinduism taught, the, that people had a soul. He said, and then he said, there's no heaven and there's no hell. You're just trying to reach this state of nirvana but it's by living your life and being reincarnated and living it lighter, better the next time. And you ultimately reach that point of salvation that you've risen above that craving, those desires of the world. But John 14 verses one to three tells us this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God and believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to us. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And then in Matthew 13, verses 41 to, 30, 40, 41 to 43, the son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. There is definitely a heaven and a hell. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you who are my followers. You're going to spend eternity with me and with God the Father. But he also says, those who reject me, who turn away from me, you're going to be going to this place as a blazing furnace where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Both of those exist. One is eternity with God. One is eternity separated from God. So contrary to what Buddhism teaches, there is a heaven and hell. We do have a soul and a spirit. We're going to make, we make the choice that we want to spend that eternity with God or we want to spend that eternity separated from God. So what's our takeaway today? Like Hinduism before it, Buddhism is more of a philosophy than it is a theology because it's one that relies totally on self-effort. It's all about what we do to try to earn nirvana. And we already know from Scripture that will never be good enough for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So more importantly, Buddhism, like every other religion other than Christianity, does not worship a living God. You know, I said earlier, that was an important facet of understanding Buddhism is that Buddha lived, but Buddha died. He wasn't resurrected. He didn't come back into his new life. And so there's, we're, we would be worshiping a dead God, a dead person that's trying to lead you into nirvana, and there's no way that can cover our sin. It's because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It gives us that opportunity, that privilege of spending eternity with him. Let's pray together, okay? Father, thank you. Thank you for the, helping us understand these religious worldviews and understand their heritage, their, how they were founded, where they came from, what they believe, and so that we can, we can look back into your word and we can find truth. And I don't want to be in a situation where I'm looking at somebody who's studying and living by the Buddhist faith and say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to look down upon them and I'm, going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of push them aside, but I want to understand where they're coming from. 
but I want to be able to share with them. I want us to be able to share with them the hope of heaven, the hope of an abundant life in Jesus Christ. So, Father, give us hearts to hear, to understand, most importantly, to love those around us, that we might share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you've heard before, if you've watched any of our good book, we have a good book Q&A Zoom session on Tuesday evenings at 7.30. Dr. Mark Strauss and I join you, answer any questions you have about the previous study, or maybe another question you have about the Bible or Christianity. We're happy to discuss any of those. We actually have a live session coming up on Sunday, July 25th at 11.30 a.m. 11 a.m. right here at the church. Dr. Mark Strauss and I are gonna be on the stage. We're gonna have just allow you to ask any questions you have about God, about the Bible, about Christianity. You can talk about this comparative uh, worldview, comparative religions we've been looking at. But we look forward to be able to get together and just uh, be able to be here in person, face to face, answer, ask those questions, give us an opportunity to answer those and just help you develop your own specific worldview and your understanding of scripture, your understanding of who God is. So thanks for joining us today. Have a great week.